From Los Angeles, California, this is Rising Up, and I'm Sonali Kohatkar. As the brouhaha over the Oscars being so white starts to die out, one wonders if the discussion on diversity in film and television will come up only once a year. Ensuring fair representation of people of color and women requires year-round effort. And one of the institutions holding Hollywood's feet to the fire is the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies at UCLA, which issues a yearly report on the industry. My guest is Darnell Hunt. He's a professor of sociology and African American studies and chair of the Department of Sociology and the director of the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies at UCLA. And it's just re released its latest report. I'm so pleased to welcome to Rising Up, Darnell Hunt. Hi, Sunali. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, before we dig into the report, let's begin with what seems like some good news. Um, I'm assuming you saw the effort by the white film director, J.J. Abrams, who's announced hiring quotas for his production company, yeah. Bad Robot. According to The Guardian, quote, Bad Robot will reportedly work with its agency partner, CAA, and studios Warner, Brother and, uh, Warner Brothers and Paramount to ensure women and minorities are submitted for writing, directing, and acting jobs for the company in direct proportion to their representation among the U.S. population. What do you make of this? Well, it's great news. I mean, I think there needs to be more of this. Uh, I commend J.J. Uh, Abrams for making this step. I mean, it's something we've been calling for for, for years. Um, someone had to do it, and, um, you know, he's a big enough name in the industry. Maybe he'll convince his, um, his peers that this is the right thing to do to basically be in the America business. And uh, he directed the new Star Wars film, which broke from the sort of standard industry pra practice by having a very diverse cast, a cast that was so diverse that it even caused some controversy among white supremacists last year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's very unfortunate. Um, you know, th these views, um, you know, where people, you know, have a hard time with, with you know, reflecting America because... That's not what they are accustomed to. I mean, it, it's unfortunately a reflection of a, a very privileged position that denies, you know, where America is going in terms of our diversity. So let's talk about the report that your uh, organization, your institution issues. Um, I understand that this is the third such report, and it looks at the top 200 films and TV shows in a given period. And um, while there were some arenas in which women of uh, women and people of color uh, gained ground, there were also some losses. Um, tell us about the report itself, first of all, and what you looked at. Yeah, so this is the third um, installment in the series. Um, we uh, released the first report in 2014, uh, and then we did a follow-up in 2015, and of course this uh, year's report. And so the goal of the report is to chart over time progress or the lack thereof. Most of what we've known about the industry historically has been rather anecdotal. There's really never been a comprehensive report that tried to um, connect the dots over time across the various arenas. So we, we look at pretty much everything. We look at the top 200 films ranked by box office. We look at pretty much everything in TV. And this year was 1,146 TV shows across broadcast, uh, cable, and digital platforms. And what we're really trying to do is connect um, sort of diversity of the lack thereof to the bottom line. That is to say, um, to explore the degree to which diversity actually sells. You know, as a sociologist, I'm more interested in the images and the impact the images have on society and the way we see each other. But that moral argument is not something that's moved the industry. The industry is much more concerned with the bottom line. And so if we can show profitability, if we can show that indeed increasingly diverse audiences want diverse content, I think we have a much better chance of spurring people like the J.J. Uh, Abrams of the world to actually you know, make the types of choices they need to make to move this industry into the 21st century. I want to focus on what you just said, that um, 
that, that you basically have um, America's increasingly diverse audience preferring diverse films. And mm -hmm. honestly, I'm so sick of films that are centered on only whites that I just won't go see them anymore. Yeah, I mean, I just yeah. refuse to watch TV shows where there's not a single person of color in a lead role. And I imagine that even white audiences might be getting sick of seeing such homogeneity on their screens. The world just doesn't look like that. Mm. No, you're, you're exactly right. So one of the things we do um, for film, of course, um, this year for the first year, we actually have rent track data that surveys um, ticket buyers as they're leaving the theater to get a sense of who the audiences are. And what we found was that the, the number one film in um, 2014 was Transformers Age of Extin Extinction, made uh, $1.1 billion uh, globally. Uh, people of color were responsible for 60% of those ticket sales. In fact, of the top 10 films ranked by box office that year, people of color bought most of the tickets for them. So what we're finding is a consistent pattern. We found this three years running now. The films that on average um, tend to look like American society in terms of their diversity um, receive the highest box office. And the same thing is true in television. Uh, TV shows that tend to be more diverse on average have the highest ratings. And this is not only for households of color, we also found this with white households that, as you said earlier, they also want to see something that rings true, that looks like the world that's around them. Mm. Now, uh, is there a difference that you found um, in cable versus broadcast, uh, online shows, um, you know, versus the sort of traditional outlets, yeah. film versus television, where women and people of color are concerned? Well, you know, there, there, is, there is a pecking order, so to speak, in terms of which platforms are the best. So across the board, film is the worst. Film, film is just pretty horrendous. Um, you know, in every arena, in front of the camera, behind the camera, people of color and women are underrepresented. Women particularly get slammed as directors in film. I mean, the, the single worst statistic in our study, and this has been true for a couple of years now, is women directors who are underrepresented by a factor of nearly 12 to 1 among, among directors. And so it's one of the reasons why, you know, Ava DuVernay, a couple of years ago when she was snubbed by the, um, by the Academy, you know, wasn't even nominated um, as a director. I mean, first of all, a woman director is very rare, and a woman of color is almost unheard of to direct a critically acclaimed film. And the fact that she was acknowledged by the Directors Guild, but not even nominated by the Screen Actors Guild, I mean, by the, um, uh, the Film Academy, was, was quite egregious. So, so, yeah, and then if you look at television, uh, broadcast um, tends to be a little bit better than cable only because broadcast is trying to reach the largest audience possible. They're not um, usually niche marketing in the same way that some cable networks are. So, for example, in cable, you have El Rey Network that targets Latinos. You have TV One, BET, Oprah Winfrey Network that, you know, tend to skew African-American. Uh, Oprah Winfrey also women. Um, lifetime for women. For those reasons, um, the numbers are a little different in cable. Um, women actually do a little bit worse overall in cable than they do in broadcast. And people of color actually do a little bit better in cable than they do in broadcast. So it's, it's, it's a mixed game. But, um, but across the board, film is the worst, followed by broadcast and then, then uh, cable. Have there been gains made in broadcast television? I mean, we have, you know, say a director like Shonda Rhimes, who right, is right. so prolific, who yeah. is just, you know, one show after another, and they're hit shows. Um, you know, it, is she still as rare as one might imagine as a, a female uh, and a person of color um, in this industry for broadcast? Yeah, I mean, she is, she is quite um, a rarity. I mean, you know, um, we're, 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 the study we're talking about this year looks at 2013-14, so we're about a year and a half behind, only because it takes so long to collect all this data. And there have been some things that have happened in the last two years. I mean, the, the emergence of Empire, for example, which is, isn't cap captured in our study, but clearly has made a huge impact. I mean, it's the biggest you know, um, television debut probably in 20 years. So you know, I expect when we do next year's study that we'll, we'll see a little bump because of a show like that. But across the board, these shows are still outliers. They're still exceptions to the rule. Most shows don't look like Shonda Rhyme shows or, or Empire. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think if we, if we talk about, you know, across all 1,146 1, shows, um, the shows that are, you know, great examples of diversity with diversity in front of the camera, behind the camera, you know, are relatively rare still, unfortunately. 
So uh, I'm glad you brought up the issue of directors and writers, especially. I mean, is it true? At least you know we've seen with uh, directors like Ava DuVernay and and Shonda Rhimes that uh, they tend to do shows that are more diverse. But is it tr is it generally true that if you have more people of color and women writing scripts, directing films and and TV shows? that we are likely to get greater diversity simply by virtue of having that representation behind the camera? Well, absolutely. And the point we make throughout our report series is it's actually more important to focus on what's happening behind the camera than in front of it. In some cases, you can have window dressing where, and this is what the industry has typically done, whenever it is critiqued, they'll hastily throw a couple of more faces in front of the camera. And unfortunately, those faces are usually just there to support the lead who remains white, who is often male, and um, it's never their story. And, and what we're talking about is whose stories are we telling? And in a diverse society, um, people watching television want to see their own stories. They want to see people who look like them, uh, people they can relate to, experiences that resonate with their own. And that only happens if you have diversity behind the camera. The people in the writer's room, uh, the people who are pitching the basic concept for a show or for a movie, the person who's writing the, the script for a movie, these people need to be women and people of color as well. And that's really the great frontier where we haven't made quite as much progress as we have in front of the camera. And even in the meantime, though, um, do you think that white writers and directors are feeling the pressure today to write shows that are more diverse? I mean, there's a new show coming out called Underground about right. the uh, underground uh, slave revolts. And I believe at least one of the writers is white. Uh, Joe Pekaski, um, you know, very uh, sort of liberal uh, leaning writer and director. Sure. Um, and so do you feel that, that ri white writers and directors are feeling the pressure, realizing that the scrutiny of reports like yours, like the social media uh, trend, uh, hashtag Oscar so white, is putting them on notice? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, in the last couple of years, I mean, you know, two years running now with the Oscars and no nominations for uh, people of color in the major actor categories has kind of shined a spotlight on something we've been talking about for generations. Um, the other thing that's new is that demographically um, what they're doing or, or business as usual in the industry is really unsustainable. I mean, people of color are about 40 percent of the population now and we're increasing, um, you know, that that share about a half a percent a year. So if you do the math, um, 10 years, that's another 5 percent, another 10 years, that's another 5 percent. And guess what? We're at majority minority status. Uh, we also know that people of color um, buy more movie tickets, particularly Latinos, um, and African Americans and Latinos watch more television. So at some point, you're losing the audience and you're leaving billions on the table. And that's the argument we're making by not diversifying. But it's not enough just to diversify in front of the camera. You also have to do it behind the camera because you have to tell diverse stories. So yeah, I, I think that white writers, uh, producers, they're feeling the, the pressure. The problem is they don't particularly know how to make the type of programming that I think the audience ideally wants. Right, what, I mean, a white writer writing a dialogue for a person of color is not, you know, is not able to draw yeah. from their own experience. Well, you know, it's not like, you know, I'm saying that only black people can write for black people, only Latinos can write for Latinos, only women can write for women, et cetera, et cetera. But you have to have those perspectives in the room so that you can negotiate. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a collaborative industry. I mean, very rarely do people do things individually or, or solely in this industry. You're always working with other people. And the point we're making is, you know, having more voices in the room, more perspectives in the room will always produce a better product and one that's going to be more in sync with where the audience is. And so I think uh, uh, white, you know, talent, white writers, producers, directors, they're definitely feeling the pressure. In the past, they could get away with just making something from a white point of view. And clearly now, you know, the numbers are beginning to show that this is just not going to be sustainable. Right. I mentioned Underground. There's also Border Town by Seth MacFarlane, which is a TV show written by a white writer, but he has made a big deal of bringing on consultants such as Gustavo yeah. Ariano, uh, yeah. which at least, you know, is paying lip service to having some representation behind the camera. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's also talk about the fact that there is a, there is a filtering process, right, Darnell? I mean, uh, it's... Um, possible that there are scripts being promoted, being put forward, pilots that are um, mm -hmm. in the works uh, that that do uh, get, have much more diversity, that yeah. are presented by people of color, and the gatekeepers aren't necessarily letting enough of those through. Is that an issue? 
Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things we've looked at for the last few years is the role of the, of the talent agencies. And we refer to that section of the report as gatekeepers because they are gatekeepers. And in fact, increasingly, the, the three or four, you know, Uber major agencies, you know, control the lion's share of what happens in, in television and film. Uh, in television, for example, something like 94 or 95 percent of all major TV shows were packaged at one point by one of those major agencies. And what we mean here is that those agencies, their, their business basically is attracting A-list clientele who they can then have on their roster and put together a package. That is to say, we'll, we're gonna attach this, this, um, this novel or this script written by this famous writer uh, with this really um, hot lead in Hollywood with a hot director and we're gonna sell the whole package to a network or to a studio uh, ready-made. And, and this is essentially the way it's done. So these agencies work as brokers in the process, and they make most of their money from kind of the back end of, of these deals and, and packaging fees. So, you know, that, that freezes out, you know, other clients, um, clients of color, for example, who aren't lucky enough to be represented by one of these major agencies. And so if they're pitching a project, if they have an idea for a new TV show, they're not represented by one of these agencies, A, they have a hard time getting in the room to even make the pitch, and B, when the packages are being put together by these agencies, they typically aren't a party to it because they're not being represented by those agencies. So it becomes very difficult to kind of break into essentially what's a pretty closed um, process for women and people of color. Oh, well, Darnell, I'm also wondering what role social media plays in pressuring the industry. Um, people of color are very active on Twitter and um, often, I mean, we, I mentioned the Oscar So White hashtag, but, uh, you know, they're constantly commenting on the shows they watch and the films they go see. Um, yep. Do you think social media as a, you know, a means of popular expression is also pressuring the industry and driving the industry to do better? Yeah, there's no question that social media is, is a game changer of sorts. Um, look, one of the issues for years that advertisers, particularly for you know broadcast and cable networks that are driven by advertising dollars, it's a little different for Netflix and Hulu and some of these digital platforms because their, their business model is based more on subscription and you know, and we didn't streaming. even actually get to talk about that. Those are really yeah. important and increasingly important uh, platforms. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So the, 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 the economics are a little different. But, you know, advertising still matters. Ratings still matter. And, and the problem with ratings, of course, is that, you know, the question is, what, what do they mean in, in an era where you can fast forward through all the commercials and, um, you know, and, and you may have your TV on and you're being captured as, as watching a show, but you're actually in the other room washing dishes or whatever, you know. Well, um, recently Nielsen introduced a new social media rating, which is based on Twitter um, and tweets and unique authors and all this. And, and it really measures social engagement with the show, which I think is a much better measure because it's talking about active engagement. To actually tweet about a show, you have to physically do something, which means that you were engaged with it on some level. Well, guess what? When we looked at Twitter ratings um, in this study, we found that lo and behold, um, the, the, the the chart, the graph is very similar to what we see with conventional ratings, that TV shows that are more diverse, you know, garner the highest number of tweets and the highest number of unique authors. In fact, it was off the charts, um, you know, in, in cable. Um, in fact, the, the, the shape of the graph looked very similar to the shape of the graph for African-American viewers, which again underscores the degree to which people of color are overrepresented among social media users. So at every turn, we're arguing in our report that probably and arguably the most important audience segment right now is people of color and that's what's really driving the whole process and to not have them included at the very beginning of the development process it is just sort of misses the whole point of where the market's going and Dar Darnell, let's uh, also just stress finally the importance of representation on screen i mean you know some people might say look at a time when uh, black and brown kids are being gunned down in the street sure. by police, when we have vigilante gun violence, when we've got this very important election uh, coming up this year, why are we spending time talking about how women and people of color are represented in TV shows and films? I mean, that's pop culture. How do you respond to that? Sure. Well, to the extent that we ignore pop culture, we do so at our own peril. I mean, you know, it's no accident that the NAACP, one of their first campaigns back in 1915 was against the birth of a nation. I mean, they understood 
um, the power of images to sort of shape the way we see our fellow humanity, or, or in some cases, um, uh, to see people that we don't consider part of the human race, which was the case for, for many um, persecuted groups of um, people of color or, or throughout our history. So um, I would respond that uh, media, media images, particularly when we're constantly bombarded with them the way we are in our society, tend to normalize um, the things you see. And so to the extent that people of color and women are absent from certain types of narratives, then um, the presumption is, particularly if you don't have a lot of face-to-face -face contact with them, is that they don't matter. And so this whole idea of Black Lives Matter is, is in a way, um, correcting sort of a, 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 sort of a, a national, um, I guess, tendency to sort of treat people of color as if their lives don't matter, if they're second, as if they're second-class citizens or not quite human. And a lot of that is reflected in the media we see um, and, and through the, the types of roles that are portrayed. So um, one of the reasons why I think a number of advocacy groups over the years have advocated for the inclusion of people of color, not only in front of the camera, but also behind the camera, is because the stories that we, we tell need to be humanizing. We need to understand and respect our fellow humanity. And I, and I think that, you know, while Hollywood entertains us, it's not just entertainment. Well, I want to thank you so much, Darnell, for joining us today. Give out a website where people can download the report. Sure. Um, so the website for the Bunch Center is www.bunchcenter.ucla.edu. And Bunch is spelled with, with an E, B-U-N-C-H-E, center.ucla.edu. Uh, and if for whatever reason you can't find it on our website, you can just Google uh, 2016 Hollywood Diversity Report, and I'm sure it'll come up. And we'll post that as a link to our website, risingupwithsonali.com, later today. Thank you so much, Darnell. Thank you. Darnell Hunt is a professor of sociology and African American studies and chair of the Department of Sociology and the director of the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies at UCLA. This is Rising Up. I'm Sonali Kolhatkar. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next time. Rising Up with Sonali is hosted, written, and executive produced by Sonali Kolhatkar. Anna Bus is the producer, technical director, and web and social media supervisor. Our theme music is by Grammy award-winning band, Gets Up. Like us on facebook.com slash RU with Sonali. That's the letters RU with Sonali. And follow us on twitter.com slash RU with Sonali. Our website is risingupwithsonali.com where you can find all our programs archived and where you can get direct access to all our video and audio files. Thank you.